In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, all praises you to the Lord, Master of all the worlds. And peace and blessings be on all his prophets, and especially the final prophet, the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him and his family. Respected members, subscribers to SaidAmmar.com, our beloved guests, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, I bid you the Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the greatest blessings I've had in my life is the blessing of being a student of knowledge. And I remain a student of knowledge. It does not matter how many books you read or how many lectures you've given, you continue to be a student of knowledge. And you hope that it's not only information that you're gaining, but at the same time, you're applying it. But there is a sense of responsibility that comes with disseminating that knowledge as well. In the past, the dissemination of the little knowledge that I have has been through the wonderful medium of the Mambar. In many of our communities, as we know, in the holy month of Muharram and the holy month of Ramadan especially, we come together and we listen to lectures from the pulpit. But I believe that now I have to add a new dimension, which hither to this point I may not have focused on as much as I may have about 10, 15 years ago, and that is to teach the very courses that I was privileged to study under some of the most erudite scholars in the Muslim world. There are many lectures which I've given that in reality needed a lot more time and in some cases needed more discussion than the 45 minutes uh, to hour that we are allotted, for example, in the community. And I began to realize that while the medium of the mambar was one way of giving back to the community from the knowledge that we had studied in the seminary and in the academy, there was a need at the same time for us to maybe give back of those modules that we had studied in the seminary or indeed in the academy. I was privileged enough to study under experts in their field, but not just teachers, but also father figures, role models, and people who were able to give you insight into the world of Islamic studies, where knowledge was not just something passed on from someone who you may have liked or not liked, but rather a role model who tried to become a beacon and a source of insight for you in your life. I remember, for example, that there were some scholars who I sat under in terms of their lessons, some who my continuous visits to were some of the best moments of my life in relation to the knowledge that I gained. To sit in a class of Ayatollah Sayyid Fadl al-Milani is a wonderful experience. A man whose knowledge of jurisprudence and as well the principles of jurisprudence is in the eyes of some unmatched in the Western world. But alongside him to have the honor of sitting with Ayatollah Sayyid Hussein al-Mudarrasi, one of the greatest scholars to have emerged, not only in the seminary, but also in the academic world. And let us not forget, certainly last but not least, in relation to those who I benefited from, from the mujtahids of our time, who I had sittings with, or who I studied under, was Ayatollah al-Jalali in Chicago. May Allah bless his soul. That you could sit with him and he could open for you the doors of knowledge from the many books that were in the room at the time and how he could take you back generations and take you to the different manuscripts that one could hardly get hold of. And yet he would open for you many different angles for you to understand a very simple question. Therefore, these scholars were amongst the scholars that I benefited from. I cannot forget, of course, Hujjat al-Islam wal muslimin Sheikh Ahmed Wa'azi, and his lessons when looking at the principles of jurisprudence of Ayatollah Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, may Allah bless his soul. Or how could I forget Hujjat al-Islam wal muslimin Sheikh Muhammad Sa'id Bahmanpur and the brilliant lessons that he gave us, especially in the world of hadith, which many may not associate with him in relation to his knowledge of the Quran. There is a profound knowledge in the world of hadith. As well, I look at the late Hujjat al-Islam wal muslimin of course, our respected Sheikh Ilmi, 
who was the head of the Islamic College for Advanced Studies for the period while I was there and was able to provide us with wonderful discussions on Quranic exegesis. At the same time, Professor Abu al-Fadl Izzati, as well as Dr. Khalil Qusi, when it came to the world of al-fiqh al-istidlali and us trying to understand the processes of deriving law, but also Dr. Khalil Qusi in opening for us Bidayat al hikmah and Nihayat al hikmah of Allama Taba Taba'i, and for us to understand the world of philosophy. I must also mention that there are some who provide you with the depth of knowledge who many in the world may not know of. But when you sit with them, you continue to learn. A special mention must be given at the same time to Sheikh Yahya Simo and the unbelievable depth of knowledge and research that he has undertaken, where when you sit with him and you have a mubahatha with him, he is able to open for you many doors of knowledge and indeed will always remind you of a text that you should be reading that you may have not necessarily come across recently. There are many of these great scholars who you benefit from either directly or indirectly. Sheikh Muhammad Ali Shomali, Hujjat al-Islam, when Muslimin Sheikh Shomali, without a doubt, in terms of a person who's able to provide you with insights on the text you're studying, but also on the context of what's happening around the time, all of these are people who you benefit from directly or indirectly. And therefore, I felt it was my duty in this coming year and coming years, inshallah, if God grants us a long life, to teach a number of the subjects, if not all the subjects that I was privileged to study in my years in the world of the seminary, but also the lessons that I learned in the academy. How could I forget the expertise provided by my supervisors when I completed my PhD? Professor Sajjad Rizvi, Professor Robert Gleave, and Professor the late C.E. Bosworth. Because on the one hand, there is a traditional method of learning, which without a doubt is a method of learning that has spanned centuries. But I realized that many in our communities their methods of learning were stop-start or bits and pieces. And I felt that there was a need for a more structured method of learning rather than a method of learning where a person sees you in Muharram and then does not see you again until the holy month of Ramadan. On SayyidAmmar.com, inshallah, our aim now is to provide a curriculum. A curriculum of learning based on not just my studies, but also my experiences of those particular subjects, those modules, and the overall framework in understanding the development of the history of the religion of Islam. There are many of us who know that Islam is, for example, 1,400 years old. But there are many of us who do not necessarily understand the evolution of the religion of Islam. If you were to ask many within the Shia community to explain to you the evolution of the world of jurisprudence or of the world of theology or of the world of law or of the world of ethics or of the world of philosophy or of the world of mysticism, you'll find that many will not be able to tell you about the evolution, in my opinion, of all of these. They might be able to tell you bits and pieces, either discussing the evolution of theology in the time of the Imams, but not knowing about the evolution of theology after the period of the occultation. Or they may be able to tell you about the period of the occultation and theological developments in that period, but not in the period of the Imams. They might be able to tell you about the names of certain jurists today. But there are many jurists from Halab or from Hilla or from Kashan or from Hamadan, which many of them may not know, but who were significant in an unbroken chain of jurists that goes all the way back to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Therefore, because of this, I felt that not only do I want to teach these subjects, but I also wanted to maybe give some insight that I may have now 
in my 40s, which I wish I could have had when I first studied these subjects in my 20s. If I go back, for example, to when I was studying under, for example, Ayatollah Fadl al-Milani, when you're 24 years of age and studying a particular subject in jurisprudence, or when you're discussing principles of jurisprudence in the eyes of Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr with Sheikh Ahmed Wa'azi, your insight into the development of the principles of jurisprudence literature today may be different to what it was then. When a person looks at a text in many fields of the studies that we do, there are many of us who may not know the context of the Damascus and Glitterim. Many of us may not know the context, for exa example, of Qatr al Nada, Wab al Sada. Do we understand, for example, why Ansari is doing a sharh of this particular Arabic text? What is, for example, the aim of Shahid al Awwal while in prison to think of writing Al Lum'a al Damashqiya? And how is this reflected later on with Shahid al Thani's Rawd al Bahiya in the discussion or the explanation of Al Lum'a al Damashqiya? Sometimes you hear these names Sadr, Ansari, Shahid al Awwal, Shahid al Thani. But we're not able to map all these names. Sometimes it may be the most simple exercise. But there is a time when a person wants to understand where all these people fit in in our 14 year, 1400 year history. I have a duty to disseminate what I've learned. I have a responsibility as a teacher in the way that I disseminate. And that's why of the text that is fundamental, that anyone aspiring to be a student of the religion of Islam or a scholar, if God blesses them with the chance of earning that title, is to read a text, for example, again, of Shahid al-Thani, like Munyat al-Murid, Fi Adab al-Mufid wal-Mustafid. This text, is a text that allows you to understand the role of the teacher and the role of the student, the etiquettes of a teacher, etiquettes of a student, the environment that must be created between the two. It is vital for us to, in a way, begin with such a text. But at the same time, I don't just want to open the texts. I want to also give certain skills that I wish I had acquired in my early 20s, many people assume that when you're a public speaker, you've gone to public speaking classes and you've studied under a great speaker. For us in the English generation, it was trial and error. And that's why one of the core modules that I will teach, which you may not necessarily find as a module in Hawza and Najaf and Qom, will be a module on public speaking. It can be worked on. You can train someone in the world of rhetoric, in the world of eloquence, in the world of oratory, in the world of presentation, and in the world of structure. The Sheikh Ahmed al Wa'ili public speaking course on SaydAmmar.com, you may join if you're an aspiring speaker or you're someone who wants to see your children develop into being speakers and being able to present themselves. And let's remind you that to develop skills in speaking does not mean that you're looking to become a mambari, a khatib, a zakir, a rosa khun. You could also be someone who just wants to have that charisma to be able to discuss the religion in a way that's not going to put people off, but it's going to be vital in helping make a point that could be over lunch in the canteen at your workplace. We named it the Sheikh Ahmed Al Wa'ali course in public speaking, not only because of the wonderful legacy of Sheikh Ahmed Al Wa'ali when it comes to khitaba and when it comes to oratory and when it comes to speaking, and his lectures are still listened to by young and old worldwide. But at the same time, 
I was someone who was inspired by Sheikh al Wa'ili. And I believe that if a person can look at the way he revolutionized the public speaking environment in the Shi'i world, then from the experiences that I have and the skills that I can give back, we can produce more speakers. Those speakers could be speakers for the classroom and not necessarily on the pulpit. Because there are certain people who may have a worldview that the less they speak, the more wisdom they have. And that silence might be the best option on the basis of certain literature. But at the same time, we will always need representatives who try their hardest to at least stand up and defend our beliefs. And this idea of defending our beliefs is why we move on to the other modules that will be taught. Because without a doubt, there is a need for us to be able to study our theology, our creed. Why is it that I believe in God? How do I discuss the existence of God? But then how do I discuss God's justice and questions concerning predestination and free will? And the intrinsic understanding of good and bad. Is it within my primordial nature or is it just what God decrees? And my understanding of prophethood and my understanding of infallibility of the prophets, but also successorship to the prophets and the position of the imams. In turn, understanding that I have to know the imam of my time and then understand that there will be a day in which I will be resurrected and the proofs for resurrection, both textually as well as rationally. There are certain bastions of thought who I want to teach either about or teach their texts when it comes to creed, when it comes to theology. And it's vital that at home we know these personalities. Whether in the time of the Imams, such as Hisham ibn al-Hakam, whether, for example, in the period of the occultation, when a person goes to a number of particular figures when it comes to their theological texts. And I'll only mention a few. It's vital that one looks at Shaykh al-Mufid. May Allah bless his soul. Or one looks at Allam al-Hilli. May Allah bless his soul. Or one looks at Khawaja Nasruddin al-Tusi. May God bless his soul. And one looks at Shaykh Muhammad Radha al mudaffar who we will come across a lot in the curriculum because his legacy is so strong that you'll often hear Usul al mudaffar Mantiq al mudaffar And without a doubt, his work on the Shi'ite creed, like the works of Khawaja Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, Allam al-Hilli, sometimes we may hear in lectures people mentioning, for example, Al-Bab al-Hadi Ashar, or people mentioning Al-Tajreed, or people mentioning Kashf al-Murad, or people mentioning Aqaid al imamiyah These are key theological texts, and one may also make the point that it's vital that we study Sheikh al-Saduq in order to understand the differences that could occur even in the world of theology. Because if these differences occur, for example, in our own lifetime, then some of us get confused and rattled. But it could also be in the case that in the period just after the Ghaibah, there may have been differences that may have existed between teacher and student. Remember, there is this period of scholars who I believe hither to this point, many of our communities when it comes to their understanding of scholarship may not have read their works, but it's vital that people like myself try and disseminate and discuss some of their works. Try and remember always, Saduq, Mufid, Murtada, Tusi. In the world of theology, we are being questioned on many areas. And dare I say there's a, a new theology where a person has to discuss issues concerning pluralism and human rights. And how can I look within the 
literature to even answer questions on salvation of the non-Muslim. All of these issues I will seek to discuss in the theology part of the curriculum. Alongside theology, where a person, if they remember that tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, when you saw a group of people very impressed by someone who was knowledgeable of the of the world of um, Ansab, he was an Asab and he was knowledgeable about genealogy. And then the Prophet, peace be upon his family, looks at them and he says that there are three areas where it's vital that a person has knowledge. And it's not genealogies as such. Rather, a person should have knowledge of Ayatul Muhkama or Sunnatun Qa'ima or Faridatun Adila. The first one is about theology. Now, when a person says, what's the second one? Sunnatun Qa'ima, the world of ethics. Without a doubt, alongside theology, there are certain texts which remind us that in respect of how much knowledge you have, if you've not pondered over your ethical development and not understood the diseases that you could have in your life, which are spiritual diseases, which I cannot go to a pharmacy and get resolved. I need to go to the spiritual pharmacy. That is the Quran and the teachings of the prophets in the holy household then I may end up being someone who has a lot of information and a lot of knowledge, but I'm affected by envy. I'm affected by arrogance. I'm affected by hypocrisy. I'm affected by anger. Now, how do I work on resolving these issues? And how do I develop a moral trait to become second nature to me and not just a one-off act? When I call someone generous, is it because I've seen a one-off act of generosity from them or has generosity become second nature? And how about in the development of my akhlaq, how do I ensure that I have understood the nuances involved in each of the moral principles or vices that I may face in my life. There are certain scholars who have written about the world of ethics and morality. And I think more than ever, we need that in our communities today. Naraqi, both father and son, have left behind a legacy in ethics. And it's vital that one opens Jamia Sa'adat, especially to look at the discussions. That period in reality is a wonderful period when you're looking at Shi'i scholarship, Naraqi, Bahbahani, Kashf al-Ghata, Bahr al-Uloom. It really is a wonderful period of a number of different sciences. But Jamia Sa'adat is a vital work which needs to be discussed. But also I would say the 40 hadith of Ayatollah al-Khumayni is one of the most underrated works when it comes to looking at traditions from our texts that help us understand our moral vices, help us to understand how to purify our soul, knowing that the soul has faculties such as anger, imagination, and desire. Such texts are fundamental. One may even bring together with an Arfani element, a mystical element, Awsaf al-Ashraf of Khawaja Nasir al-Din al-Tusi as being a fundamental text where the six or so sections are split wonderfully concise, short, to the point. I want to understand zuhud. I want to understand piety, to the point. Explain, verse, explanation, move on. So it's vital for us to be able to open those texts as well. The Prophet also mentioned Faridatun Adila. There is a need for us to more than ever 
and of the utmost importance in relation to our happiness in this world and the hereafter is to understand Islamic law and the philosophy of law or the principles of law. And that's where you always hear about usul, al-fiqh, and you hear about al-fiqh itself. Al-fiqh wanted to open a door for us for deeper understanding of what brings us sa'ada. How do I attain felicity and happiness in my life? And that comes through the obedience of the Lord. But what is obedience of the Lord comes through me understanding the legislation of the Lord as discussed by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And remember that we have an unbroken chain from today all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon his family, of an unbroken chain of jurisprudence and jurists. From the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family, and then into the Ghaybah, we have scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar all the way until today. We had some scholars from Qum and some from Baghdad. Some scholars from Ray and some scholars were from Halab. Some from Hilla and some were from Najaf. Some were from Mashhad and some were from Samarkand. And some of you may hear all of this and say, did we have famous scholars in Halab? and Samarkand? Well, a person may go towards certain scholars and if they see their names, they will see that their names will take you to a Samarkandi or al Halabi. Some might take you to jurisprudence in Sham. And you look at them and you see this wonderful ability to derive law from the original sources. All of these great scholars left behind for us a legacy until today in the world of law where I now realize why something is wajib, why something is haram, why something is mustahab, why something is makruh, why something is mubah. But I also understand the different levels of what is obligatory. I understand and I'm therefore able to open up certain texts in the world of law. But there is a need for us to look at how law can also be split into different sections. There is a law in relation to family law. There is a law, commercial law. There is a law in relation to biomedical ethics today. And so there is a need for us to also discuss contemporary aspects of the law. But also principles of jurisprudence allows us to understand the development of legal theory and the philosophy of how one derives law. And the challenges and the debates and the critiques and the discussions where again there is an unbroken chain. Some might point to the fact that it's Imam al-Shafi'i who is the one who opens up all discussions of the principles of jurisprudence. And while some may not deny that in terms of a framework, it does not mean there were not essays written in the time and the lives of the Imams where there were already discussions on certain issues within the principles of jurisprudence. Look at that unbroken chain again and ask yourself how many of you have heard of these names let alone looked at their ideas? How many of us have ever heard of the dhari'ah of Sayyid al-Murtaba? There are many who may have heard of him but many have not heard of the dhari'ah. How many have heard of Uddat al usul How many knew, for example, about the life of Sahib al-Ma'alim? Do we understand the legacy of Wahid al-Bahbahani or Mirza al-Qummi's Qawaneen? How many have opened up Sheikh Murtad al-Ansari and understood the profound importance of the Rasail and the Makasib? Or indeed, Ahund 
Bukhara'san is kifaya. And then from there, understand the legacy, at least in the last hundred years of so, of Ayatollah al burjurdi and Ayatollah Muhsin al-Hakim, and Ayatollah al-Khu'i, and Ayatollah al-Khumayni, and Ayatollah Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, and Ayatollah Sistani, amongst others, in their profound discussions concerning whether I could find a ruling through the secured evidences or the Adilla al muhriza or the original sources such as, for example, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, Ijma' and Aql. Or what do I do practically when I may not have found what the ruling is? Which usul al-amaliyya do I go to? Is it in this moment istashab? Is it bara'a? Is it, for example, ihtiyat? Or is it takhir? And then from there, opening up the world of language and understanding of language and understanding, very importantly, the apparent meaning of the Qur'an and its importance in the religion of Islam. Because if there's one area we've neglected, I'd say there's always two, that is the Qur'an and the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. The Qur'an will be a fundamental discussion in our curriculum. There are questions always asked about the Qur'an today. Questions internally and externally. Externally, there are those who continue to doubt whether the Qur'an is a revelation of the Lord. And there are those from other religions who may actually mock the Qur'an, question its validity, or question certain verses of the Qur'an. So there's a world of maybe tafsir that we need to open up. How many of us have looked at tafsir, such as the work, at tibyan of Sheikh Tusi? which would be the main until, of course, Tabrasi comes with Majma' al-Bayan. But then there are others, of course. When a person wants to look at, for example, al-Mashhadi, or Taba Taba'i, or Mughniya, or part of what some scholars may have tried to leave behind in terms of their works on tafsir, having not been able to complete a tafsir, such as maybe a mystical element or Mullah Sadra. The world of tafsir is vital, but I do believe that while we will do tafsir, it is of the utmost importance that we go to uloom al-Qur'an and understand the debates surrounding the text, the compilation, the structure, the order, the readings of the Qur'an. You know very well that internally us, the Shia, have been attacked all the time for having a different Qur'an. But was there a codex other than Uthman's codex? Is there a possibility that Ubay bin Ka'b or Zayd bin Thabit or Abdullah bin Mas'ud may have had their own compilation or Imam Ali salam's compilation? What happened to that compilation? Could Hafsa, daughter of the second caliph, also kept a particular compilation of the Holy Quran? Is there a possibility? that there is tahrif. And if some of the scholars of the Shia believed in this, could there be a possibility that some of the non-Shia believed in this as well? And if some of the non-Shia believed in this, and today people are raising questions about takfir and kufr, what happens if someone who's a non-Shia scholar may have gone for a particular reading different to the reading that the Muslims have today? And how do I look at the original word of God versus the qira'ah or versus what Uthman the Caliph has as the set code is for everyone to use. Ulum al-Quran has had great scholars. Without a doubt, whether one looks at Hadi Ma'rifat or Ayatollah al-Khu'i, they both provide us with in-depth analysis on the many issues that come up when it comes to tafsir and ta'wil and nasakh and mansukh the world of abrogation and the world of revelation and asbab and nuzul and whether something is in Mecca or something is in Medina and the world of compilation and questions concerning the miraculous nature of the Quran. Is it al-Ijaz al-Arabi? And maybe we can look at, because Arabic becomes fundamental. Arabic is the most fundamental science in a person at least progressing to be able to read any piece of literature. Nahu al the Sharh, 
of Ibn Aqil on the Alfiya, Al Ajur Rumi. All of these are fundamental texts. I want to study morphology, I want to study syntax, I want to study balagha, I want to look at a word, I want to understand the composition of the word, its role within a sentence, and looking at the way it can be used and the different words that can be used for that one particular word. All of this is vital, but all of this remains important as a language because of the position of the Qur'an. I'm going to teach ulum al-Qur'an on the basis of the opinions of the great ulama when it comes to the position of the Qur'an in the religion of Islam and the contemporary debates which continue to rage in the world of academia. One may look at scholars who are at Harvard who are continuously discussing the manuscripts of the Qur'an. And we all know that people bring the Sana'a manuscript and other manuscripts, the Kufan manuscripts, and begin to ask questions. And we will shed light on this area as well. But alongside that, fundamental is that we study the seerah of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. How many of us can hand on heart say that we know the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family inside out, and he is our role model first and foremost. He is the exemplar in every aspect of his life. And there is a need for us to dissect the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. I remember at least, it must be nearly 10 years ago in the holy month of Ramadan, I gave 27 lectures on the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. And I only had reached Medina. But there is a need for us to open up the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. It can be opened up through Arabic historians. Uh, such as say Ja'far Murtad al-Amili or the scholar Najah al or a person may open up Rasul Ja'far Iyan or Ja'far Subhani to look at the way that they have analyzed the biography of the Prophet peace be upon his family. We can examine the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt as well. Sometimes an author such as Donaldson may not only shed light for us on creed but also on the lives of the imams but at the same time you go to Sheikh al-Mufid's Kitab al-Rashad and it allows us to understand the lives of the imams as well and I look forward in the curriculum to try and open up for you the debates concerning the lives of the imams but also the history of the Shia after the Ghaybah you ask many of the Shia they'll tell you about the first few hundred years of the religion of Islam because the 12 imams are present well how about in the occultation how much have I studied the Boyids how much have I understood Baghdad and the rational inquiries and discussions that are taking place? How difficult were the scholars of Qum in the way that they looked at the world of Hadith? Why had Shi'ism reached Aleppo? Why had Shi'ism reached um, Samarkand, which may have been part of the Khorasan province at the time? Uh, why has Shi'ism re reached, for example, parts of Samarra? How do I understand the Seljuks and their relationship with the Fatimids, how do I understand the Boyids? How do I understand the Ottomans? How do I understand the Safawids and the Qajar and contemporary Shia communities? What I'm really doing here is I'm moving from a world, for example, of Saduq, Mufid, Murtada, Tusi, but I cannot forget Ibn Idris, Ibn Al Walid. I then can move on to Alama, his uncle, his son, Shahid al Awal, Shahid al Thani, the Jabal Amal group who produced for us Karaki and Baha'i. And then how can I ever forget Alama al Majlisi and Hurr al Amali and debates within the Shi'i school, such as the Akhbari Usuli debates? What's the position of the Fawa'id al Madaniya? What is Astarabadi trying to tell us? And what is Bahrani's positions that we need to understand the hadaiq and the role of the world of aql, hadith, ijtihad, and whether these are to be rejected. Can the Quran ever be understood? Or is it only the family of the Prophet who teach it? And where does Wahid Bahbahani come in? And how does the Jew of Bahbahani and Ansari and Shu'o, that we understand the Usuli element of a Shi'ism today. Look how we have brought all these names together. The curriculum will try and provide an overview. But an overview that won't just look at theologians and jurists, because many of them could be called polymaths. 
Where do you get an architect and engineer like Sheikh Al-Baha'i? And those who are willing to delve into the world of astronomy and music and geometry. So why can we not look at in a world where there are so many philosophical debates, although philosophy today is more related to the nature of knowledge and language, but how about the nature of existence? And that's where we open the door to at least having an introductory look at the many different movements of philosophy in the history of the religion of Islam. How many of us know about Mullah Hadi Sabzawari? And how many of us know about Mullah Sadra? How many of us have understood discussions of, for example, Ibn Sina all the way to Allama Tabatabai? When we mention, for example, the peripatetic school or the illumination school or transcendent philosophy, some people today may say that this is heretical, but why was there a clash concerning philosophy? And is there more than ever a need for us to understand the nature of existence and the property of existence? and the dimensions of existence, and the divisions of existence. These, of course, don't just relate to, for example, the nature of existence. It may also relate to the nature of revelation, because the way a theologian may view revelation may be different from the way a philosopher views revelation, may be different from the way a mystic views revelation. They may also all have different outlooks when it comes to the way we attain knowledge of haq. Is it through rational inquiry? Must there be a mystical element and an illumination of the heart with certain spiritual practices? If knowledge is a light from God and the heart is to be purified, what then happens? And what are the discussions that a person needs to understand about God's attributes, especially when one opens the Asfar and the journeys of Sadr and understand the nine volumes and what the ultimate aim is? My aim is not to conclude for you how you understand the Islamic world, but is able to provide for you a glimpse of some of the texts that I may have studied and to give back to you. How many of you ask me about the world of hadith? And in the curriculum, we'll open the door of Rajal and Diraya. Rajal is not to look at a biography of a narrator, but to try and see what methods that we can authenticate a hadith what principles and framework we can use when we look at that individual narrator. Is he of the Ashab al-Ijma' or not? How was he when he was younger? And how was he when he is older? Was he an extremist when he was younger? And does he develop when he's older? Is he more outspoken when younger and when older? And why does Ayatollah al-Khu'i begin to raise question marks on some of the conclusions of his predecessors? Does everyone agree on Ibn al-Ghada'iri? How do I understand the framework of Tusi and Keshi and Najashi? And how about contemporaries such as Tustari and Mamakani? All of these names allow us to go into the world of hadith both from the angle of Rajal, as Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Radha Sistani has done in allowing us to elucidate on the many discussions on Rajal, as well as the late great Ayatollah Asif Muhsini, but also at the same time in Diray and understanding what was Allama al-Halli seeking to change from what could have been there before in terms of his predecessors on the world and the structure of hadith? And why do the Akhbaris say, in some cases, at some points, don't question the four books? What do I do with a narrator who's majhul? Does a hadith that's da'if necessarily mean that you can't take it? How do I use other contextual indicators or qara'in for me to reach a conclusion? And then that opens the world in the world of other forms of literature, such as ziyara literature or dua literature, or even questions concerning fiqh and historical literature, do you now see that in the curriculum, the aim is to give back from what the greats have given me of my limited knowledge, but of what I'm able to elucidate upon from the studies that I have undertaken. I will teach each subject, as you will see on the curriculum, but I will also seek to phone a friend every once in a while and say to them, I'd love for you to make a guest appearance. And there are some friends of mine who trust me are treasure troves of knowledge when it comes to the different areas that I've discussed. I will be your reference for when you wanna apply for a particular seminary or even a university 
the test here will come from me in terms of the fact that I know that you've studied this to a level where inshallah if you do proceed to go on to Najaf and Qum, I know there are certain people who at the age of 16, 17 think to themselves, I want to go to Najaf and Qum now. And sometimes their parents may say to them, finish university, get a degree and then go to Najaf and Qum. You could do this simultaneously. You could study the curriculum and study maybe a secular degree and then from there decide to go to Najaf and Qum. And I think it will stand you in good stead, especially when you are able to understand the whole framework and the whole structure of how everything works. And I hope even the course on public speaking will give you other skills that may even put you ahead in terms of the world of tabligh. So on the one hand, a tazkiya. On the other hand, our discussions, our teaching of these modules, our course on sayyidahammar.com, the curriculum, will also allow for a few people to have some sort of, if I was to use an Arfani term, dhok, taste of Najaf, our affiliation with Najaf will mean that at the very least the summer course will be there for you to have a glimpse of what it feels like to be in the vicinity of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. I was fortunate to be in the vicinity of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam for a number of years but to be next to the Amir has to be the ultimate honor if one cannot reach Medina. And so at the same time, there will be scholars from Najaf, from Karbala, from Qum, who will be giving us insight. But also those in the world of the academy will also be able to come on and provide you with insight. And if they've seen you in those classes, for those of you who are budding to do a master's one day or PhD, then they'll remember you. And that might help you in the application process as well. But above all else, above all else, a person has to have that, to use a fiqhi terminology, qasd al-qurba, or an intention to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and studying all of these. At the end of the day, you can have all the knowledge in the world. And yet, one sujood means you fall forever because of your arrogance towards Adam, alayhi salam. Alongside that knowledge, we pray that Allah gives us two things, I would say. Amongst many. But Basira and Hikmah. If I'm able to give you back some of the insight and some of the wisdom, and I'm far from being the most wise, but if I could give you back some of the wisdom and insight that I gained in these years, and how important it is to go to the grassroots and to work with the grassroots and to serve the grassroots so that the name of the Lord is the most high and the word of the Lord is the most high. And the message of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family continues to be the most high. This will only stand you in good stead. Because at the end of the day, you have to leave a legacy behind. And part of that legacy could be knowledge for yourself or knowledge for your children or knowledge for the community. We face many challenges now. And while many of us have sought to give back in the world of knowledge, whether on the pulpit or even in the madrasa, we have to step up. And inshallah, on SayyidAmmar.com, join me. And let's work together and go on a journey together to continue to help each other progress in our learning and in our education, where even the angels will look at us in awe and where on the Day of Judgment maybe 40 memorized traditions with some application may help us. Thank you for listening. Inshallah will be a great year ahead and I thank you for your support in this past year. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.